If you have a Bible, please turn to Psalm 50 once again. By the way, um, if you didn't receive a text from me this morning, either you're on our list, members list, but you don't have a cell phone, or you're not on our members list, if you consider this your church home, and yet you didn't receive a text this morning from me encouraging you to be here this morning, uh, please go to Belong, which is right after the service. It includes lunch, and you can get signed up, or you can just, if you're already, you've been a part of the house for a long time, you've been to Belong, just use the Connect card in your bulletin to write down your info and make sure we have it, including your cell phones and your email addresses so we can get information to you because we have cool things coming up and we want to make sure that everybody knows about it. We want to make sure our communication system is up to date. Uh, but if you're new to the church and you want to go to Belong, we want to encourage you to go to that. It's really sort of the first step in. It's a really good way to get to know what's going on. Also, we are going to be tentatively starting our um, Healing and Miracles Night. Uh, I haven't talked to the staff, but very soon. I'm, I'm buying for next month, but I don't want to announce a date yet. I have to talk with the staff one more time. But we really feel like we need to get on this. So begin to pray about who you can invite, especially that doesn't know the Lord, uh, to this Healing and Miracles Night. It's going to have a little shorter version of worship. We're going to have a gospel message where we preach the gospel and invite people to come to know Jesus, and then we're going to pray for the sick. All right? Sound good? And so I want to encourage you to be thinking about who could I invite to that who has any kind of ailment or would like healing, and uh, that's going to be awesome. All right. You guys in Psalm 50? We began a series last Sunday called The Beauty of Divine Order. I really believe God is into this series. I was sharing last Sunday that I have a colleague who, uh, who isn't into series. He thinks they're not as spiritual, but I just want to let you know that God is into spontaneity, and he's also into planning. He's into one-off messages that are just divinely inspired in the moment, and he's also into plan, uh, preparing and planning a series. He likes both. God isn't, he's not one-dimensional, and you know, he, he can handle a lot of different styles and ways of doing things. And, but he is a God of supreme order. Now, that doesn't always look like order to us. You know, I've shared that there's a difference between the order of a cemetery and the order of a nursery. You know, you can have the order of a cemetery, but everything's dead. You know, everything's in straight rows, and it looks really nice, but there's no life. You can have the order of a nursery where there's lots of noise and chaos and even some weird smells, and yet everything's in perfect order. As long as you have enough workers, you know, it works. So, so order isn't, isn't necessarily what we think of when we think of order. It's coming into the ways of God. That's maybe the one good way to say it. We come into the ways of God. God has ways of operating, you know, a.k.a. modus operandi, M.O. He has an M.O., and we need to learn his M.O. and not just operate in our M.O. because we can read the Bible and we can say, okay, I am going to do what the Bible says but not do it God's way, and then it doesn't work, and we're wondering, well, is the Scripture not true? But it's actually we just we took God's instruction, but we did it our way. And so coming into the beauty of divine order is, is learning the ways of God. It's learning the heart of God. You know, it's one thing to know what God says. It's another thing to know why he says it. And when we know the why behind the what, we just do better. You can't always know the why behind the what. Job didn't know why he got uh, 18 months of boils from head to toe. He never really found out. So sometimes we never know the why, but it's good to have a general sense of why God wants us to do things because we tend to respond better. So the beauty of divine order is coming into the why of God, not just the what of God. Amen? Does that make sense? So I shared last week that uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 40, all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. So that's all things must be done properly in an orderly manner. My paraphrase would be God's command to all believers is everything that we do in life and in ministry is done with excellence, carefully arranged and set in divine order with the good discipline of a taxidermist. So it is appropriate before God and appears right to others. So there's something about God that he loves pageantry and po protocol. He's not into appearance for appearance sake, but he loves it when things are done right. You know, he said to Moses, I want you to build the tabernacle. See to it that you build it according to the pattern that I showed you on the mountain. So the Lord released a vision to Moses of what the tabernacle was supposed to look like. He spoke it to him. He instructed him. And then he said, now don't just go build whatever you want. I want you to build what I showed you. And so in, a, in many ways, the, the Lord is, that's true with our lives. I remember when I was a teenager and I said, Lord, what is my life going to be about? And I've shared this before, but uh, I just, you know, I used to journal quite a bit. I don't journal as much anymore, but I used to journal a lot almost every day. And I, I just wrote down what I felt like my life was going to be about. I just wrote 
um, I'm going go to I'm gonna go to school and I'm going to become a, I'm going to learn how to build houses and then I'm going to become a teacher and then I'm going to become a pastor and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become a missionary. And uh, that's exactly what happened in my life. The Lord just showed me my life. He doesn't always do that, but he does, I think he does it to those who ask. You know, because I'm like, Lord, I want to cooperate with what you're doing in my life. I don't want to be pushing against You know, I don't want to try to be somebody else. Just tell me what my life's about, and that's what I want to do. And so coming into the beauty of divine order is understanding how God's made you and flowing with that. So it actually, it's not a chore. It should actually be a a pleasure to come into divine order because it actually, it takes away unnecessary resistance from our lives. Amen? Um, So we're going to read Psalm 50. If you have a Bible, if you just want to hold it up, um, either a smartphone or a... um, a physical Bible or whatever. I actually have my Bible on a piece of paper today, so this is pretty, this is pretty lame looking, but just trust that the Lord's gonna use this piece of paper. There's Psalm 50 right there. All right, let's hold this up. We're gonna make a declaration. Let's say this together, ready? God, your beauty captivates my heart and your ways are higher than my ways. Would you help me understand, embrace, and walk in the beauty of your divine order according to your word and by your spirit in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Now I'm gonna just, rather than read the whole chapter which we did last week, I'm just gonna read uh, a verse at a time to summarize some points that we made last week. And if you weren't here last week, feel free to uh, go on to everydaychurch.com and just, you can download the message, you can listen to it, you can watch it, whatever you need to do. And, uh, but I want to just quickly review the six of the seven realities. There's seven realities in this psalm that I want to just kind of go over quickly. The first one is that God is speaking. Verse one, the mighty one God, the Lord, has spoken and summoned the earth. When God wants to say something, you know, um, Jesus did it in the New Testament. He said, truly, truly, I say to you. Now, you know, God doesn't he need to say truly, truly twice. He could just say it once. So he's not saying, hey, I'm really going to tell you the truth this time because I'm not an honest God. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I want you to pay attention to this because this is really, really important. So it's a way for Jesus to emphasize the truth. And in the same way, this psalm starts out and says, God is wanting to say something. This is a big deal, guys. God is speaking. And he's speaking from the place of beauty. I love that in verse two. It says, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shown forth. Now, the reason that's important is that this is a corrective psalm. And sometimes when we read corrective things, how many of you cringe about correction? You don't have to raise your hand because I know most of us do. Nobody likes to be corrected and hopefully nobody likes to give correction because correction just isn't fun. In fact, it says in Hebrews 12, no correction is enjoyable but painful. All correction is painful. All right, so let's just, as a given, let's just say nobody likes correction and you're gonna be doing good. But what the Lord is saying, The Lord is speaking, point one. Number two, the place God is speaking from is out of the place of beauty. And what he's gonna talk about is divine order, which is why I'm calling this series The Beauty of Divine Order. I I want us to see that divine order is beautiful. You know, and another verse that I love is it says, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Sometimes we think holiness is holier than thou or it's self righteousness and we miss the whole concept, it's beautiful. The holiness of God is beautiful. It's like the ultimate reality of purity and light and gorgeousness of of sincerity of heart and no shadow of turning, no misgiving, no say one thing and do another. God and his holiness is completely right and pure. And for us to gaze upon his holiness is to gaze upon beauty, something beautiful. Not something that is frightening or is condemning, but something that's beautiful. It's the beauty of holiness. And what we're talking about is the beauty of of divine order, okay? So God is speaking from the place of beauty. Number three, God is, is in fact judging his people. This is a psalm of judgment. Now again, judgment is not judgmentalism. It's not God being down on people. It's God saying, this is right and this is wrong. That's what judgment is. It's the person who's qualified in the position of judge saying right, wrong, innocent, guilty. That's what judge, that's what, that's the, that's what it means when it says God is judging his people. He's putting on the robe and saying, okay, I'm gonna take a look at things and I'm gonna tell you what's right and wrong. Now, God has a solution for it. It's not just to make us feel condemned, but so many of us are afraid of God's judgment. How do you know that if God didn't judge, we wouldn't need Christ? There'd be no need for Jesus if the Lord didn't judge, but he judges sin. And he judges sin, the Bible says the law is given 
to point out and put a yellow highlighter on sins. Why? So we'd feel bad? No. So we'd realize, oy vey, there's no way I'm going to make it. I just mess up too many times. I'm just, I've got too many issues. Exactly. That's the law's job. The law's job, it says, is to be a tutor to point us to Christ. So we, we look at all the things, the list of things that we've done wrong, the list of requirements uh, of, of, from God and the list of uh, things that we've done wrong as against us, and because of that, we just go, I need a savior. That's the purpose of the law. And from that place, we walk over into the grace, the abundant grace, and the free gift of righteousness in Jesus. Amen? That's the beautiful thing about the gospel. And so God judging his people doesn't have to frighten us. It needs to sober us. So it's not a thing of fear. It's a thing of, okay, I'm listening. Tell me, God. In fact, um, I was talking with, uh, you know who it was, uh, guys? It was Joe Cummings. I was on the plane with Joe Cummings. Remember Joe Cummings from, you guys know him from Kansas City? Did you know him, Joe Cummings? Yeah. He was part of the, uh, one of the five pastors in Kansas City Fellowship back in the day. Anyway, I was on the plane with him, and he said, he, he, he was saying, um, I've learned to pray this prayer. God, you can say whatever you want to me. Just say something. And I really appreciated that because it's, sort of, it's like saying, rebuke me, tell me you love me, correct. Anything that comes out of your mouth is going to be full of life. Even if it's corrective, it's going gonna, it's gonna to bring life to me because you're a good God. So whatever you want to say. And sometimes we're so afraid. We're like, uh, God, could you just tell me you love me and that's it? Don't say anything else. We're like afraid of the voice of God. But how many of you know that when God speaks, Jesus said, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. Even when the Lord corrects, he imparts life because he brings alignment to our souls. Sometimes we're living in such chaos, we're so out of order, and God comes along and says, that's wrong. And our, our soul comes into alignment, like we snap it out of it and we snap into alignment. And instead of it being condemning, it's actually life-giving. We're like, oh, wow, I'm back. I, I, I'm remembering who I am and what I'm for, and I, I, I was in a fog. I was in the fog of sin. What happened to me? It's because God spoke a corrective word. And so God is judging his people and he, we need to listen, that's the point. The point is, listen up. Number four, God appreciates our spiritual effort. The judgment isn't just condemnation or disapproval of everything that we do. That's not what the judgment's about. In fact, he says, I don't, I'm not turned off or despising or rejecting your offerings. I appreciate what you're bringing to me. I appreciate your sacrifices. I do not reprove your sacrifices, the Lord says in verse eight. But he's also calling his people to something new. And that something new is a sacrifice of thanksgiving. He says, look, I want you to come, and I'll talk about this in a second, to the place of gratitude, and I want you to call upon me, and I'm gonna answer you, and you're gonna honor me. In other words, let's get back to a relationship of dependence. I'm God, you're not. Please enter back into the right kind of relationship. Enter back into this place. And then, and then sixthly, God describes evil behavior, and the very first thing he says is that my people have, have engaged in evil, and the very first type of evil they've engaged in is they hate discipline. They don't want correction. Remember we just talked about correction? I wonder if we could just say this together, I love correction. I don't love condemnation, and I don't love shame but I love God's discipline because it proves I'm his child. Read Hebrews 12. Those whom he loves, he disciplines and corrects. He disciplines every son or daughter that he receives. When you are disciplined, it's a sign that you're his because you're not out as an orphan just wandering the street with no parent. You've got a parent. You've got God. He says, look, I love you so much, I need to say something to you. That's a sign of his love. And if we could learn to see it that way, we'd stop despising discipline and correction. We'd start embracing it as a sign that God loves us, that we're wanted, that we're noticed, that he cares what we do. You know, the whole latchkey kid generation was in many ways a sign that kids weren't cared for. It's produced horrendous results, tremendous drug addiction. People that are like, yeah, I, I don't know. I come home and it's like my parents just, I don't know, maybe they don't care. Of course, that's not always true. Sometimes it's two parents desperate to keep their kids alive and to work, and so it's not necessarily true, but it's how it's perceived, isn't it? So God's saying, hey, I, want, I never want you to feel that way. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna speak into your life. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you know I'm here. I'm gonna love on you, and when you get it wrong, I'm gonna say something to you because I care about you. I am intricately involved in your life. 
The Bible says in Psalm 139, he's intimately acquainted with all of our ways. Hello? So he's describing evil behavior. But I want to get to this point number seven, which is really the first point of today's message. That was review. This is sort of where we want to focus, okay? God is calling you and I to the beauty of divine order. And I'm going to read verses 23, uh, verse 22 and 23, sorry. Now consider this, you who forget God. So the first thing he says is consider this. What I'm about to say, I believe what that means is what I'm about to say may not come naturally to you. I think the reason he's saying consider this is it's going to take you a minute to get your mind around what I'm about to tell you. This is, by the way, this is the Lord speaking. Now consider this, you who forget God. What does that mean? Over time, when we don't fix our eyes on the ways of God, we just make God like ourselves. In fact, one of the things that the Lord says about his people is that he says, you thought I was just like you. One of the most tragic things in life is when we make God into our own image. Because that's a God that can't help us, can't save us, can't change us, can't deliver us, because basically we've made God ourselves. And if he could change us, save us, deliver us, and help us, we could have done that for ourselves. The reason that we need God to be different from us is because we can't change ourselves, we can't heal, we need God to come and save us and heal us and deliver us, it's called salvation. And the people that get saved are the ones that realize they need salvation. I need a savior. Other people are like, no, I'm good. I'm my own savior. I'll take care of business myself. So it's, you know, uh, people say Christianity is a crutch. I say we're all crippled. We are, we're all disabled, and we all need help. And the people that realize that are the ones that come to God, and then he abundantly delivers them and pardons them. And the ones that don't, God says, I love you so much. I'm going to let you stay in your own understanding of life. Even though I know better, I won't force myself on you. You just live that way until you're ready to come to me. He doesn't reject them wholesale, he just gives them more time. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but all would come to repentance. He's not slack concerning his promises, he's not tardy, he's not lazy, he's just waiting because he cares so much about people, he's like, I'm gonna give them a little more time. Come on, Lord, judge them. You do not know what spirit you are of. I came to save people, give them more time. That's the Lord. And so he says, consider this. I want to say something to you guys. Pay attention, humanity. And he says, first of all, that we need to live in the realm of the sacrifice of thanksgiving. I'm still actually reviewing. But we need to learn to not allow our emotions to rule our spirits. And secondly, we need to become a grateful people. Can I just tell you this? One of the characteristics of a religious spirit is ingratitude. The Pharisees, the Bible, here's what the Bible says about the Pharisees. They laid burdens on people that they weren't even doing themselves. They weren't happy with themselves and they weren't happy with people around them. So they were all about, this is, they were all about making sure everyone felt as miserable as they did. That's what religion does. Jesus is calling us to a a life of thanksgiving and gratitude. When you walk And I'm not just preaching positive thinking right now. The Lord made up gratitude, okay? When we live with an attitude of gratitude, we live in the spirit of thanksgiving, it lifts our spirits, it changes our perspective, and it delivers us from a life that's out of order. Gratitude is the quickest way to come into divine order. Just being thankful, just thanking God. It changes our perspective, it it takes off darkness and oppression, it says the spirit of heaviness is removed by the garment of praise. As we release worship and praise to God, as we begin to thank him for who he is and what he does, the heaviness comes off of our spirit. If you are heavy today, the, the, the fastest way out of that is gratitude. If you, walked, if you said, I'm gonna leave this service and go down to the beach and I'm just gonna give thanks for everything I can think of for an hour, I know that sounds tremendously tedious, but, or a half, do 30 minutes, 30 minutes of just gratitude, just, Lord, I'm gonna, spend, I'm gonna walk to the pier and back from end of Grand Avenue, it takes about an hour, and I'm just gonna thank you for everything I can think of. And when I get run out of things, I'm gonna ask you to remind me of the next thing. I'm gonna start, you know, I love what Stuart Devine says, he says, go through the alphabet, start with the A's, you know, I thank you for Audrey, you know, I thank you for all the people of Everyday Church, and you just start thinking of things that start with the letter A, and just thank God for it, and then when you're done with that, go to B, and you will, you will not exhaust the list by the time you get up and back and you walk for an hour, and if you do that once a day, you'll never be the same. I remember this woman came to me um, when we planted our church in Ohio, and we had, we, she, she had a really, really tough situation. Her husband 
had fallen off of a ladder and he had landed wrongly and his leg went up. It drove up into his hip and he was disabled in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. He was a, he was a big, big, strong construction worker and unfortunately he landed wrong. And so she, had, she went from, um, you know, I think a housewife to getting a job because she had to support him and she had to roll him around in the wheelchair. They had to build special ramps. It was like exhausting. And this was a precious woman, but she, and I don't blame her, I don't judge her. I, we may have done the same thing, but she had grown to a place where she was just bitter and ungrateful about everything. She was just complaining about everything because her life was terrible. And uh, as a pastor, you know, I cared, I sympathized, I prayed with her. We, you know, we had her over for dinner. We did what we could. But we were having this big dinner, uh, lunch gathering after church one day, and the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to challenge her to 30 days of gratitude. And it felt like, it felt like a harsh counsel. So I said, the Lord spoke to me, uh, I'm not gonna say her name, but the Lord spoke to me, sweetheart, and I believe he wants you to take on a 30-day challenge. And you know she did, and the first thing we noticed, the next week we saw her, her countenance was glowing. She was alive. And she was smiling, and she didn't have a complaint. Not that there weren't wrong things. She was transformed from the inside. Her circumstances didn't change at all yet. She was transformed because she was giving a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And the Lord's word is true. God's word is true. If we'll enter into the sacrifice of thanksgiving, that's the very first way to come into divine order. All right? But the next thing in verse 23 is what I want to focus on. It's so crazy powerful. We've got a few minutes left. I'm going to go through this real quickly. Christians all over the world want to know, what kind of life does God bless? How can I live a life where I know for sure the blessing of God is going to be on my life? Here it is. This is the answer we've all been waiting for. All right? You guys ready? It says, to he or she who orders his way, orders her way aright, I will show the salvation of God. Here's, here's some things about that verse. Number one, divine order requires intentionality, okay? Divine order requires intentionality. It's something that you and I do and no one else can do for us. We must order. We must order our way aright. The Hebrew word is sum, and it means to carefully determine and establish habits and patterns, working at them, until you are transformed. How many of you have done athletics? I think I asked this last week. I'm not sure you've done any kind of, oh, you know, any kind of athletics, actually. What's the secret to athletics? There's one secret. It's called muscle memory. Athletes, professional athletes, have practiced so many times that they do naturally what other people do awkwardly. So that's why pros make something look easy that those of us, you're like, I could shoot a three-pointer, and then you're like, brick, and it's like, you know, and, and, and then you get really, you practice like for two years, and you can shoot one out of ten, you know, and they're shooting them, boop, boop, Steph Curry, boop, 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 you know, because he's practiced a gazillion, and he's gifted, but he's also practiced a gazillion times, and muscle memory is so key, and what the Lord is saying here, what the word sum means is spiritual and emotional muscle memory. That's exactly what it is. It's carefully determining, establishing habits and patterns, working at them until you are transformed. Now, I wish I could say to you that all transformation is super glorious and super supernatural and super flashy and super wah, but it's not. A lot of it is super simple and boring. It's, it's, it's building a new habit. And a lot of Christians are looking for something other than that. They're like, that doesn't sound very spiritual. There's got to be a different answer. Can I get prayer fall down on the ground? Yes, that might work. The problem is it works for one out of every 200 people, one, one out of every two or three years. It's the exception. So what we do in, in Christianity is we platform the exceptions and we try to get everyone to make those the rule, and we're doing people a grave disservice. Can I just tell you, the way to be transformed, the way to come into divine order is by having new habits and patterns. That, that is the way. That's God's way. The bride, as I said last week, uh, Revelation says the bride has made herself ready. Why would the scripture say that if it wasn't true? Why would the Bible say in 1 Timothy 4, train yourself to be godly? That doesn't mean you're self-reliant. That means you've got a part. Of course, God's the one that does the transformation, but we facilitate that through our habits. 
You know, the times where the Lord corrects me, and my wife knows this because I tell her, the times that the Lord rebukes me and corrects me, it's always about habits. It's always about consistency. He's always like, I've shown you so much, you've done so much, you've seen so much, you've been exposed to so much, you've experienced so much, but have you built the habit into your life? And the areas where I find I'm troubled is where the habit's partially built in. So I'm inconsistent. And that inconsistency is one of the most painful things. How many of you know if Brock and I are friends, which we are, and and we see each other two out of three times, we have a cordial, nice discussion, but the third time Brock blows up at me or I blow up at him or I blow up at him and he starts crying or he hits me across the face and I fall down and and I pass out, which is very likely. Um, (laughs) We're gonna have a rough relationship, why? Because the two times of amazing kindness and joy are overshadowed by the inconsistency of the third time. That doesn't discount the fact that two out of three times we're having a great experience, but it's the inconsistency that kills the relationship, isn't it? It's so hard to have inconsistency. Now, that's discouraging a little bit when you're in the process of change, like, well, I don't have any hope. That's why we need grace for each other, because we're all in process, right? Nobody's got this thing down perfectly, but we need to be growing in consistent habits and patterns. And as we do, we learn how to order our way aright. Ordering our life requires intentionality. Number two, ordering our life, divine order, is a lifestyle. It says, he who orders his way. Now that word way is, is there anybody here named Derek? Okay, well then I can talk about Derek. And I'm gonna talk about anyone. The Hebrew word for way is Derek. And it's come from the word Derek. And it means to determine the course of your life, listen, listen to this, to determine the course of your life through your actions and your conduct by putting one foot in front of the other day in and day out in the journey and process of life, treading over every obstacle and smoothing the way in front of you until you establish a new road, God's road for your life. Did you catch that? to determine the course of your life through your actions and your conduct by putting one foot in front of the other day in and day out in the journey and process of life, treading over every obstacle. And this is what it means when it says, make smooth a highway for our God. It means through consistency, by walking that road, you're gonna kick out the rocks, you're gonna get rid of the ruts, you're gonna make something so smooth, you're gonna become a human tamper, and you're gonna tamp that dirt, you're gonna tamp that path until that road is just rock hard, crystal clear, and smooth as glass. And that's what it means to, that divine order is a lifestyle. He who orders his way. It's through consistent choices and habits. It's not glamorous. You may not get invited to speak at supernatural conferences, but you'll be happy. If you decide to order your way according to the Bible, which is what it says, if you order, if you soon your Derek in the Hebrew, if you order your way, you will have a happy life. You will have a content life happy life in God, productive, fruitful, consistent, joyful, content, and at peace. Because the Bible is true. When we order our way aright, we experience the salvation of God. That's just the fact. Number three, your life, this is the, this is the thing, your life and my life could be out of order today. Just a possibility. He who orders his way aright There is a right way and a wrong way to order your life. Is your life in divine order? The way you're thinking, the way you're speaking, the way you're acting, the way you're feeling, the way you're working, the way you're handling finances, the way you're stewarding your purity, the way you're handling relationships, forgiving, honoring, spending your free time, Is your spirit under God's divine order? Is your soul under God's divine order? Is your body under God's divine order? It's not simply, you guys, about being disciplined. I'm not just preaching discipline. It's, it's, it's not just changing into a different personality. Like some of you are artists, you like to get up late, and you're like, oh God, here's one of those messages I have to become a type A person. That's not what this message is actually about. That's not what we're saying. This is not a personality change message. The type A's don't have the corner on the market. If this is a type A and type B message. Type A's do it all in their own strength. Type B's don't exert the strength. There you go. We need to do it God's way. We need God's, listen, we need God's vision for our lives, and then we need to see that vision, this is really important, as a heavenly mandate, not an option. 
When you have God's vision for your life, you've got to take that on as a mandate and not an option for your life. Like when God says, I want this for you, then you have to remove every obstacle and that has to happen. Moses, God told Moses, see to it that you build the tabernacle according to the pattern I've shown you. It's not simply about trying. Can you imagine if Moses went up to the Lord after a few years and, said, and the Lord said, did you do what I told you? He said, well, I'm trying. The phrase I'm trying is a reason why you don't have to obey God. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't process. You can always say, it's going to take two years and I'm in the process. But what we do is we do something that should take six months and five years later we're still saying, I'm trying. Because we're actually not doing what God said. We've got to take it on as a mandate, not just an option. Does that make sense? Either God's saying it to you or he's not saying it to you. And if he's saying it to you, then you have to take it on as a mandate for your life. This isn't just about, as I said, this isn't just about deep being disciplined or, or you know, um, getting it together. This isn't just a get it together message, okay? You could perceive it that way, you'd be missing the point. Let me just give you some examples. In your potential, you know, um, we talked about the prophetic today. Earthquakes, cracks, people's, people's cracks are exposed. How could we become, how could we order our way aright so that we could respond to that prophetic word? What if we made a point to start prophesying life to the people around us? We put a card on our dashboard, we put a thing on our mirror and it said, pick one person today to prophesy life over. And that became a habit. In a year, you prophesied over 365 people. Wouldn't that be amazing? You would be transformed. The 365 people would have been touched, possibly even transformed, and you would have built a new habit in your life for sure. Yeah? Sometimes, trans, sometimes ordering our way right means to think differently. It's not, it's not that we need to get ourselves together. What if the song we sang today, remember? You are good, you are good, oh... You are good. Come on now. Never gonna let me down. Oh, da, 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 da. What if we just believed that? What if we just thought in the worst of times, you will not let me down? What if in the midst of crazy discouragement, we feel like failures? What if we said this, God, I feel like a failure. Life is so hard. I don't know what to do. That's okay. Be honest about that. Just have the butt in there. But you are good, and you never let me down, so I'm going to step up and into your glory right now, and I'm going to live with joy, and I'm just going to shed that skin. So check test one, two. Hello? Yeah. Woo! Okay, are we on? You good? Well, should we keep going? Battery issue? Yeah, the Lord won't let me down, but this microphone sure is. All right, we're going to just discard... Ain't no school like the old school. Ain't no school like the old school. The thing about it is, guys, is that that verse, Isaiah 55, whoops, a little crispy there. Crispy critter. God's ways are higher than our ways. His ways are higher. So this is about learning the ways of God. It's about taking a look at our lives. It's not about condemnation. We get so beat up. We beat ourselves up. We need to calm down a little bit. Look, how many of you know that you're not perfect? How many of you know that you can never come before God and say, I finally got it together? Ever. You'll never do it. It'll always be Jesus. So you might as well just accept that today and say, the only reason I'm standing before you, God, right now is because of your son. Therefore, I can be real about my life because I'm not standing before you by tucking and hiding and pretending. Look, here I am. The good, the bad, and the ugly. This isn't what makes me right before you. It's him. So therefore, I can let you have at my life. Because he qualifies me, and I want to practice now, and I want to become who you say I am. So have at me, God. You know, let's go for this thing. And in that place, we begin transformed. So, guys, our life could be out of order. And divine order looks like permanent change. This is another tough one. How many of you have made a resolution only to go back on it a week later, a month later, a year later, two years later? Yeah, I'm not condemning you. I have too. That's sort of the rhythm of life. But what if we, what if we called ourselves, not 
shamed ourselves? What if we called ourselves to a higher standard? What if when you say, I'm going to do something, you do it and you don't go back? What if there's a one-way, they call it a one-way check valve in engineering. What if you go forward and you don't go back? What if that becomes the standard of your life? You say, uh, I'm discarding this habit and I'm not going to go back. And you don't look at your track record. You look at God's power. You look at he who orders his way aright. Now, again, think about this, guys. Why would the Bible say he who orders or she who orders his way, her way aright, if it's all up to God? The verse makes no sense. We have to, by the power of the Holy Spirit, set a habit and stick to it. And in that place, we are transformed because we're giving God something to work with. So many of us are just drifting, guys. We're just drifting. Our emotions are controlling our lives. We're good if our emotions are good, but when it's hard, we're down. We're just living out of our emotions, just like this all the time. God has something better for us. He wants us to be able to look back and say, yep, I used to be like this, then I changed, now I'm like this. Do I still make mistakes? Yes, but the tone and the tenor of my life is different now. I'm a different person. One thing that we need to do for one another is we need to not be black and white towards each other because people are in process and they're changing and we need to give them credit where credit is due. When people change, we need to note the progress. When you note the progress, it encourages more progress. When you say, ah, you're always the same, you never, you always, it just kills progress. It just says to somebody, why do I even try? We mustn't do that to each other. We must applaud. Even when you see 10% increase and you're still bummed about the 90 you haven't seen, you got to applaud the 10%. Why? Because when you applaud the 10%, it becomes 15%. But when you condemn the 10%, the 10 becomes, goes back to zero. We have to be about permanent change, but we have to help each other along the way. I love what uh, Phil Elston prophesied over me years ago. He said, you're going to be able to say... Um, I'm not there yet, but I'm farther than I used to be because God is helping me. I'm not there yet, but I'm farther than I used to be because God is helping me. Come on. That needs to become our chorus. That needs to become our chant. Divine order carries a powerful promise. I'm just going to finish with this. To him, to her, that orders her way aright, that orders his way aright, I will show the salvation of God. That word salvation is yesha. It's one of the most powerful Hebrew words in the Old Testament. The word for show is ra, and it means to access by encounter. It means to experience favor. So yesha is healing, deliverance, safety, and well-being, and ra is access by encounter and experience. So here's what it means. The people who take the time Listen, this is the punchline. You need to get excited about this. There you go. Thank you, Mike. So we're just going to talk to you the rest of the, just a few more minutes, just you and me, all right? Just give me a couple more of those. And, all right, yeah, here we go. Mike, the people who take the time and make the effort to bring permanent changes to their lives, experience and encounter God in a new way. Listen to this part. They walk in healing, deliverance, safety, and well-being as a continual lifestyle. That's actually what the same thing in Isaiah 58. When we, make, when we align ourselves with God ways, God's ways, we, we don't just fast food, although that's good, but we actually fast the Isaiah 58 fast. Where we, give our, we, we go low and slow. We give ourselves to the hungry. The Bible says we'll experience continual well-being. We're like a well-watered garden with continual guidance and continual watering. There's a lifestyle available to us, guys. As we order our way aright, there's a lifestyle of favor, blessing, rain, goodness, glory, salvation, well-being, healing. The inconsistency isn't on God's end. We're like, what happened, God? Yesterday you were like all over me, and today I can't even feel you. That's not, that's not the Lord. That's not the Lord. That's on us. And it may simply be we have to push past our emotions and say, God, I know you're with me yesterday when I could feel you, and I know you're with me today when I can't feel you because you are good. You are good. Oh, oh, you are good. 
Now, of course, the danger, of course, is that when we don't walk in divine order, we may not experience salvation, healing, deliverance, favor, safety, well-being. My point today, we're going to talk about how to do this stuff in the coming weeks, like how do we order our way right? But my point today, I want to encourage you to hear this message not from the place of works that makes you tired. To hear it from the place, the invitation from heaven that God is setting you up for success, that if you'll order your way aright, you're going to experience everything you've ever desired. There's an invitation. Listen, I want to tell you, in a, in a culture of entitlement, in a culture of victimization, in a culture of not taking responsibility for our lives, if we will step into this place of saying, I will order my way aright, I'm going to step, I'm going to step in, even if it takes me a little bit of time, I'm going to order my way aright, your life is going to never be the same. If we blame God, other people, our past, our poor upbringing, our parents who weren't there for us, our pastor who didn't say hi to us, whatever it is, if we blame, 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 we'll never get there. It's the bride who made herself ready, right? It's the person who said, you know what? God has given me what's, it's called, it's, you can't find this in scripture, but I call it an empowered will. Christians have an empowered will. That means that you have the ability to truly choose. The only people in the universe that can truly choose are Christians. You know why? Because the Bible says that the devil is the God of this world, and he's, held, he's holding captive the world. So they have limited freedom. They have the freedom to do his will. That doesn't mean they can't do good. They can do a lot of good. I don't mean that. But they can't ultimately connect spirit to spirit with God because their spirit is dead. It doesn't mean they're not, they can be great people, they can be philanthropists, but they can't, there's a part of their life that's limited. When you become a Christian, your will becomes actually empowered. It becomes just like Adam and Eve before the fall. You have the ability to walk with God in the cool of the garden and make choices every single day to walk with God in the cool of the garden every single day. You're the only people, Christians are the only people that have a truly empowered will. And because of that, the Lord has statements in Scripture that appeal to your empowered will. If you believe advertising, if you believe the culture, if you buy into victim mentality, if you buy into entitlement, you'll never take advantage of what you've been given, which is an empowered will, because you'll always say, I can't, I'm trying, it's not working. You'll always have a reason and excuse why you can't be transformed. God's transformational power is hovering over your life. And as we order our way aright, we experience the deluge of his glory. It's not him withholding. He's just, there's certain conditions, I hate to tell us, that need to be met for some of the blessings of God. The blessings, there are blessings of God that are conditional, 2 Chronicles 7, 14 being one of them. If my people who are called by name, my name, will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, that's an if-then proposition, that's called conditional blessing. If you'll do these things, I will do this. The Lord's saying, if you'll order your way right, I'm going to bless your life with salvation, healing, well-being, safety, deliverance. It's going to be awesome. Everything you've ever desired is found in Yesha. It's found in the salvation of God. And I'm going to show it to you by experience. You're, going to, you're not just going to hear about it in theory. You're going to encounter my Yesha. You're going to encounter my salvation if you'll bring order to your life. Let's, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll end with this. I, one of my friends, Doug Rowe, who I deeply respect, he's pastor of uh, the Dayton Vineyard, uh, been friends with him for a number of years, but I, I, I was around him, and I, I think I shared this before, I have shared this before, but I was around him, and I noticed that he would say statements like, I decided. Remember, I shared this before. And I always was like, I was so used to saying, God said, God told me, God did this, God did that. I was so, everything was so spiritual. What I didn't realize is that while I was giving God credit, I was also giving God all my responsibility. Because when you say God said everything, you don't have to do anything. It's all up to God. But Doug would say, I decided. I decided to get up at 6 a.m. every day. I decided to pray for our church. I decided that things needed to change on our staff. I decided, and I thought, gosh, at first it was a little bit offensive to me. Like, gosh, he's full, so full of self-effort. That's what I thought. I thought, here's this guy, when's he going to say the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord? And I was like, and as over time, I began to realize this is one of the most honorable men I've met in the Christian world in America, because he doesn't blame God for anything. Everything that's up to him, he takes responsibility for. He's not taking credit, he's taking responsibility. I decided. Why? If you say, I decided, then you're accountable for your decision. If you say, God told me, then you're not accountable. God made you do it. Most Christians live with, it's, they blame God. 
They don't realize they're blaming God. They think they're giving God glory, but they're actually blaming God's, God's, it's God's fault. Everything about my life is God's fault. If I'm a knucklehead, that's God's fault. If I'm immature, that's God's fault. He made me this way. Oh. And we just live like that as though we get, a, we get a pass on maturity because God told me to be like this. What if we said, I decided? Because of the grace of God on my life, because of the free gift of righteousness, I made a decision. Because of my empowered will in Jesus, I decided. I decided to run a marathon. I decided to live a life in shape. I decided to drink smoothies, you know, for you guys. I mean, I love what you guys have decided. You know why? Because when I see you on Facebook, I'm like, look at these two. They got married, and now they're doing, like, marathons together. It's just so cool. I just love it. That doesn't mean everybody should do that, but they decided. They just made a decision, and, and they're doing, isn't that right, Julie? You weren't doing those before you met Matt, were you? I don't think you did any marathons, triathlons. You do any of that stuff? So you guys just decided. Somehow in your relationship, you made some decisions, and it's so cool to watch people who decide things, and then they follow through on it. Now, if they can do that, you can do what God wants you to do. You can, through your empowered will, you can make decisions. As long as you say, I can't, you should just say, I won't. Get rid of I can't. I can't does not belong in your vocabulary because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But notice who does it. It's not God can do all things through me who strengthens me. It's I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You have to be in the equation. You have to be front and center and say, I'm going to do this. In Jesus' name, I'm going to do it. God's going to help me. He's going to strengthen me. But he's already helped me, and he's already strengthened me, so I can do this. If, the Lord did, if this stuff didn't count, Jesus wouldn't have said, according to your faith, be done to you. He would have said, I'll do it all. Don't worry about your faith. I'll take care. And he said, nope, actually, I want you engaged in the process. I'm appealing to your will right now. I'm appealing to your will. Not really appealing to your emotions, because your emotions may be going cattywampus right now. You might be all over the map. That's okay. Your emotions don't rule you. Your emotions are emotions. That's all they are. Sometimes they're based in truth. Sometimes they're based in fallacy. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes they're to be ignored. They're very helpful tools at times, but they're not your God. Your will is extremely important because it will determine the course of your life. My appeal is that you would embrace the beauty of divine order so that instead of asking, will I, ask, how do I? And when we go from will I to how do I, God has plenty of answers. He has plenty of instruction for us. If, we're, if, we're a willing, if we have a willing spirit, he can do something that we didn't think was possible. Our lives can be transformed from glory to glory faster than you ever thought possible if, we're a, if we have a yes before you ask the question. George Mueller says 95% of knowing the will of God is being willing to say yes before he asks the question. Lord, I want to know your will. Is that a yes? Well, what's the question? Up, oh, you missed it. Lord, I want to know your will. Is that a yes? What's the question? Up, oh, you missed it. Lord, I want to know your will. Yes. Okay, I'll tell you. That's how it works. He's looking for a yes. And when you say yes... Fulfill your vow. Do it. Psalm 15.4 says, The one who ascends the hill of the Lord swears to his own hurt and does not change. Sometimes you make commitments that hurt you. you got to keep your word. It's hard in this culture. Everybody's very quick to break their word. But what if we just kept our word, finished our commitments? That'd be amazing, huh? We can do that if we want. If we want to be those kind of people.